Well, it was yours anyways. Blessed be the name of the Lord. This morning we are reading uh, from Matthew chapter 24. So wherever you're at, I encourage you to open up your Bible at home uh, and read along with me. Matthew chapter 24, we'll be starting in verse 42. And uh, this is, this is a, uh, where Jesus is talking about the signs that are to come, that were to come, and, and there's lots of different ideas of, of when he might be referring, where he might be referring to, but the, the passage particularly that we're looking at uh, states very clearly that we are not going to know when these times are truly happening, um, and that uh, it is in vain if we try to figure out when, but rather we are called to be ready. So let's read verses 42 through 51. This is to the end of the chapter here of Matthew chapter 24. I'm reading from the NIV. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. But understand this. If the owner of the house had not known what time of night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would not let his house be broken into. So you, must, you also must be ready, because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. Who then is the faithful and wise servant, whom the Master has put in charge of the servants in his household, to give them their food at the proper time. It will be good for that servant whose master finds him doing so when he returns. I tell you the truth. He will be put, he will put him in charge of all his possessions. But suppose that servant is wicked and says to himself, my master is staying away a long time. And then he begins to beat his fellow servants and eat and drink with the drunkards. The master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him, and at an hour he is not aware of. He will cut him to pieces and assign him a place with the hypocrites, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Father, you sent. Amen. So some of you, some of you golf. Some of you don't golf, but a lot of you are familiar with the term of a mulligan. And do you just, if you don't know what a mulligan is, a mulligan is a do-over without a penalty. And sometimes in golf, what you will do, is particularly on the first tee, is you get one free shot, and if you don't like the way your first shot went, you get to hit a second ball, and the friends that you are with um, will, will allow you to do that without a penalty. Uh, no harm, no penalty, you get a start over. And for many of us right now, we kind of feel like we would like a mulligan for 2020. I, I've, I've heard this more than once. Could we just hit reset? Could we just start over? As we think of everything that has happened so far and continues to happen, uh, diseases and unrest and, and natural catastrophes, and, and it just keeps going. Uh, for us personally, this last week, many of you know because you've been following following us on social media. But on on Friday night, Garrett, uh, my my oldest son, you know he's 13, had to be admitted to the hospital to have a surprise appendectomy, and so he got up there and they had to, he had to do the surgery, have his appendix out, and of course it had actually ruptured before they took it out. So he's still he's still in the hospital. Lori's been living out at Salem Hospital with our oldest child. And I, thankfully, with the help of my in-laws, have been trying to keep the home uh, going and, and doing ministry. And you just feel like, well, of course it happened right now. Because that's the way that 2020 was going. I was very surprised about just how relaxed I was about that this was a reality because it seemed to be exactly what should be happening in this year and in the spring so far. But we, all of us, when we look at this, can consider and say, you know, 2020 is just kind of a giant dumpster fire. 
And does it feel that way? Maybe some of you are having a different experience. But as I'm walking around, as I'm talking to people, this seems to be a recurring opinion. And so what, what we need to do and we need to stop and we need to consider is how should we respond? And biblically, what is going on? Does the Bible say anything about how we should look at the situation, how we should respond to the situation, and how the situation fits into God's plan? And so we, before we even go into the text this morning, what I want us to remember is that every situation that comes our way is an opportunity for us to use for God's glory. We, we talked about this in the book of Philippians. Whatever the circumstances, I have learned to be content. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And to realize we've been given a unique platform in order to bring glory to God. And that every situation is an opportunity for us to draw closer to God. When life gives us difficult times, we can respond in one of two ways. We can either grow angry and fearful or latch on to some sort of negative emotion, or we can draw closer to God. And it's my prayer that as those of us who call themselves his children, the Bible rightly identifies as his children for those of us who are in Christ Jesus, that we would draw closer to God in this time, and that this might be an opportunity for us to know him more, to know him better. And thirdly, Every situation that comes our way is an opportunity to be a witness. That when the world seems to have lost its mind, when life seems to have gone off the rails, that we as the body of Christ, those who know our Savior, can stand with a confidence that is not in this world, but is from God himself as he sustains us, as he gives us peace, as he shows us that our heart's affection and our true desire is not on the things that we see with our eyes, but that we do indeed live by faith and can communicate the hope that we have to those around us. And so we need to react um, differently than the world, not like those who don't have hope, not like those for whom this world is their true home or their true affection, but remembering that we have a higher calling a place that has been set aside for us by Christ Jesus, which he is preparing for those who who belong to him. And that the life we've been given here is to be used for his purposes. We we are called to active duty. Um, We're not just passing through, although we are passing through, um, but without without cause, but we seek to be emissaries, ambassadors of the kingdom, servants of the most high God, representing him wherever we go. And then yes, knowing when this comes to a close, we have a home which is truly home. So in Ephesians chapter five, verses 15 through 17, we read, see then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be unwise but understand what the will of the Lord is. And then again in 1 Peter, in this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So as we consider these circumstances before we even jump in to, to what in the world is going on, remember who we are. Remember where we are going and remember what we have been called to do. That we do not view our circumstances and this life like those who have no direction, who have no hope who do not have the Lord and Savior with them. But having said that, it's been crazy. It has been absolutely crazy. I mean, just think about 2020. 
what seemed like it was going to be the story of the year as, as January rolled around were the Australian wildfires, right? You remember those, how, how fires were all over Australia and just how crazy that was. And then we went from Australian wildfires to worldwide pandemics, or if you look at this screen up here, and you're probably not even hearing it as much as we should, because it's a big deal about the locust swarms in Africa, in the, in the Horn of Africa. I, I wrote this down because it was, the, just the numbers were staggering. It said the World Bank on Thursday just approved a record 500 million in grants and loans to African countries and in the Middle East to fight swarms of desert locusts that are eating their way across vast swaths of crops and rangelands. The four areas the hardest hit are um, Djibouti, Ethiopia, Kenya, Uganda. And in Kenya, in Kenya it says, the locusts are eating in one day the amount of food consumed by all the Kenyan people in two days. Think about that. Half of their food supply is being eaten in one day. I mean, and I probably, I just said the math wrong. I know I did, but I'm not gonna correct myself. We're moving forward. But you understand, that, that's enormous. And there's other things going on. Earthquakes, where I came from. Utah was being shaken by earthquakes over and over again, and people were really unsettled. And then you got murder hornets, right? You, we, we heard that. Thankfully, it seems to be under control because I think I'm, I'm more afraid of those than I am the coronavirus. I mean, a hornet the size of my pinky that with a sting that can make grown men cry is just not, not really what I look forward to in life. But that's, that's not all. And then you have other things going on. You turn on the news and, and you start preparing your little tinfoil hat because everything seems so nuts. And then they start talking about, well, we're really thinking about microchipping human beings, you know, to tell if they were COVID positive or not, or other situations so we can help, help control the population. And your mind jumps not only to Revelation, but to every Orwellian novel or dystopian movie, science fiction movie about the future. And you say, what is happening? I mean, it feels like you're in a bad dream or you're in some sort of TV show. And you want someone to wake you up and say, that was the craziest dream I ever had. I had a dream about locusts and hornets and earthquakes and pandemics and wildfires. And then they started putting microchips. And then I woke up and it wasn't a dream. And so people, people ask, what's going on? And it keeps going, right? Economic doomsayers, people being so bad to each other. Even people outside the church are stopping to ask, what is going on? I've had conversations with people outside the church, basically about future events and prophecy and revelation. And people within the church said, would you mind just talking about, do these things fit into the Bible? Should we be getting nervous? Should we be getting ready? Should we be packing? And so we're going to take just a moment this morning, very briefly, very rapid speed, about what God says for the future. And my hope in this is, is that we'd got confidence and hope and perspective. And that we would live in a way that is appropriate as followers of Jesus Christ. Now, we're going to go really quickly through this. And if you want to do some more research um, on, on end time issues and prophecy, we're not going to be covering that all, obviously. Um, there are a couple books, which I just mentioned, that are out there. You can order them, such as... What in the World is Going On by Dr. David Jeremiah. It's a little bit dated, but the principles in there are completely true. You also have a more comprehensive book, just walking through the Bible in general. It's called The End by Mark Hitchcock. So you can consider those. We were doing a Sunday night series on this very topic uh, before everything got shut down. And the hope is to get some of those videos online quickly so that whatever it looks like moving forward, um, you, those of you who were participating and weren't participating can have access to a biblical understanding of the Bible and future events and how that fits into the whole revelation of scripture. But for this morning, we're gonna go really quickly. And whenever we talk about the future, we have to see it, or the present, in context of the entire 
revelation and time of the Bible. See, some people use the phrase end times, and it's a biblical term. It's, it's, it's a correct term to use. But we have to see it in context of the larger story of Scripture. Because at the beginning of Scripture, we see that God has created the heavens and the earth. And he created all of life, plant life, animal life. And then finally, he created human beings. And he made male and female. And he made them in his own image. And he made them for a relationship with himself. And it was good. In fact, it was very good. But we see there was something that happened, which we call the fall. The mankind was given a choice to walk in obedience and perfection and love in perfect relationship with the creator who loved them or to sin and to rebel and to try to become their own God, their own authority. And mankind chose disobedience and brought brokenness and sin and pain and suffering into the creation over which he was made a steward. And we, we were living in the reality of that and continue to live in that reality up until now. And it's more than just being broken and being hurt because sin brings judgment. It's, it's evil. Now, we don't like to call ourselves as evil, but we are in rebellion. We're, under, we're mutinous against the king of heaven who has himself all that is good and orderly and just and loving. And for us to pursue anything less is scandalous. And so we are under eternal judgment. But God never stopped loving people. In fact, he loved them so much that he revealed throughout scripture that I am going to redeem them, to buy them back, to save them from their sin by the man, Jesus Christ, who was himself God entering his creation and becoming a part of his creation in order that he may pay the penalty that you and I had earned. And we know how Jesus went to the cross, taking the sins of the entire world on his own body and paying the price so that any who would trust in him, believing in his sacrificial death and his, his resurrection from the grave, could be forgiven and restored to God. And yet we see that many choose not to come back to God for various reasons, whether it's doubt, whether it's you're like, I'm, I've still got this kind of thing on my own. I like being my own God, making my own rules, doing my own thing. I'll get around to it later. Or for whatever reason it might be, this world is still broken. And it will be until the final thing which God has shown in, in his word, which is renewal restoration because at the end of the book we see that God creates a new heavens and a new earth that they are remade again so that people will walk rightly so they will walk with their God so creation will no longer be in bondage and decay but it will be as it was planned from the beginning and so our question is how do we get from now even though we can have a relationship with God again to then how can these things go away this 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 hurting this sin, these tragedies. And, and we ask these questions. When will the world be healed? When will the cry for justice be realized? When will peace become a reality? And even those who are not believers, they long for these things. And so we're gonna look at scripture and how we go from living in a period where redemption in Jesus' name is being freely offered to all persons who would believe and what it looks like between now and we are able to enter into the renewal when Christ comes to make everything right. Now, just we want to let you know our church holds our church here to a view of the future, a theological um, understanding that is, can be labeled as pre-tribulational, pre-millennial. Uh, and for those of you who have no idea what those words mean, what, what, is that, what does that mean? It means we literally believe Jesus will literally return 
um, to earth where he will actually reign over creation, ruling in righteousness for a period which we call the millennium. Now, some other believe in his return um, in other Christian churches which affirm the name of Jesus Christ, which are true believers. They believe in a more spiritual reigning and this is not something that we break fellowship with them over. So I don't want this to become something divisive between you and another believer. But the reason we read it this way within our church congregation is because it's the most natural reading of scripture. And in the words of Dr. David Reagan, when we approach scripture, a, a key way to understand reading the Bible is this simple statement. If the plain sense makes sense, don't look for any other sense or you'll end up with nonsense. So obviously there are metaphors in, in scripture. Jesus said, I'm the door. That did not mean he had hinges and a handle um, in order to open him. They used um, figurative language just like we do. And there are genres within the Bible. But if you go from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, if you look at the way the prophecies in the Old Testament were fulfilled in the first coming of Jesus Christ, and then apply those same hermeneutical or inter, um, in, interpreting principles then we, we would expect that Jesus is indeed coming back as he said in Acts chapter one, when he ascended into heaven and the disciples said, men of Galilee, why do you look to the skies? Do you not know that Jesus will return in the same way that he left? And, and our hearts go, isn't now a good time? Isn't now a good time? We would love for you to return. Now, all these things are, are not hard to understand. For some of you sitting here, regard, depending on your, your, your background, be, turning where you are in your walk of faith, they may be hard to believe, but they're not hard to understand. That Jesus is returning. The world will be made right. But it might, and it does, get worse before it gets better. Now, I want to say this morning, I'm preaching to give you hope. I, I'm, I'm not, I don't want to promote escapism or sensationalism. That's, that's not my goal this morning. I'm preaching to remind us of why we are here as the church. Not to adapt a pessimistic view of life and ministry. Um, so this prophecy is part of the Bible. All prophecy is part of the Bible. And the Bible says that, that all scripture is inspired by God and profitable and so we want to know the whole counsel of the word of God. And that's why we're, we're talking about such things this morning. And you know what? When we know the whole counsel of God and know that God doesn't just know what's happening today, but he also knows how it's going to be reconciled tomorrow, that should give us great confidence as believers. We may not know when these things happen, but God's promises are sure. His word is certain. And when he says there will be a restoration of all things, that we as believers have a hope which transcends our immediate reality, that should give us great confidence. So let's look briefly at a few questions here that people ask. And people ask not just within the church, but even without outside the church about what we believe. When will these things happen? Um, we know the first coming of Christ happened at its appointed time. People waited a long time. They didn't know when the Messiah was coming. They had an expectation they were in the time period in which he might come. But we read in Galatians chapter four, verses three through five. Even so, when we were children, when we were children, we're in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. Everything happens at its appointed time. We just want to know when that is. We, this, is this is common. The disciples, by the way, asked Jesus that same question. That's why we're in Matthew chapter 24 this morning. Um, in Matthew chapter 24, Jesus had been telling them about how he would be going away. He had been telling them about how there would be a destruction of Jerusalem. And the disciples were confused. 
They had expected Jesus to come in and immediately establish his kingdom and rule and righteousness. And now he's telling them there's going to be a delay. And so they start to ask this question. It's, it's found in, in Matthew 24 and Mark 13 and Luke 21. And by the way, it's a little bit hard to, to understand which question he's answering because he asked three at the same time. And Jesus answers um, all three of these. They ask, when is the temple going to be destroyed? We know that was 70 AD. They they didn't know that. That was decades in the future still. They said, what will be the sign of the Messiah's return? And when will this age end? So we know that when the temple had been destroyed, we can check that one off the list. But many people today say, "When, when will the Messiah return? And when will this age end? And Jesus, Jesus spoke to them in Matthew chapter 24, if we back up to verse 3. And he said, as he sat on the Mount of Olives, with the disciples asking him privately, saying these things, what will be the sign of your coming in the end of the age? And Jesus answered them and said, take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. All of these are the beginning of sorrows. And then Jesus says, Watch therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. And then we have the passage that Pastor Ben read this morning. He says, you don't know. But what you are going to see is the wickedness and the heartbreak and the hurting of this broken world continuing. And there seems to be the expectation in Scripture, and it's actually... um, told to us quite that way, that these will increase in frequency towards the end, and he compares them to birth pangs. Now, some of you have have been pregnant with child, gave birth to a child, and others of you have been around a woman in labor, and you know that they they start slowly, these contractions, in, in a normative sense, and then they progress. And I've been told, and I'm not an authority to speak on the subject, lest I would be in trouble with my wife when I'm done with my sermon this morning, but I've been told they're not pleasant. And I've been told they get worse. And so sometimes when we see the world getting worse and worse and worse, there is the right expectation or the right thinking as we ask the question, could we be getting closer to the end? The obvious answer is yes, because it's a day further down the timetable. So of course we're closer. But just as you don't know when a baby is going to be born, unless you're inducing, you know, I know this day and age, the metaphor kind of breaks down, but just as we don't really know the due date, it's the same way with Christ's return. We can only see signs that lead us to stop and to think and to contemplate, could this be the end? Now, in the middle of this, what I want to say to you too is is don't be so anxious for the end that you miss the opportunity that God has given you now. There have always been times where things looked bleak and dark. Always been times where it looked like the end. But we, we need to be ready for Christ to come on the one hand and we need to be active until he does on the other but we don't know when, so be prepared. If we we turn the page to chapter 25, Jesus continues with a metaphor of the same truth. He says, the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to 10 virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now, five of them were wise and five of them were foolish. Those who were foolish took the lamps and took no oil with them, but the wise took oil with their vessels and their lamps. But while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. 
And at midnight, a cry was heard, Behold, the bridegroom is coming. Go out and meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, No, saying, Lest there will not be enough for us and you, but rather go to those who sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding, and the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, I do not know you. Watch, therefore, for you do not know the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. So you see, we're, we're told to be prepared. And Scripture says we're supposed to be faithful and not grow weary in doing good or surprised by the day or the hour. Another passage which many of you are, are very familiar with in context of what I'm speaking this morning is found in 2 Peter. And in 2 Peter, it tells us just because there's a delay, don't, don't stop and think like, well, I guess, I guess it's never going to happen. But rather to keep our eyes on the sure promises of God that, that Christ is indeed returning. Peter writes in his second letter in chapter three, starting in verse one of, of chapter three. He says, beloved, I now write to you the second epistle that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. Knowing this, this first, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this, they willfully forget that by the word of God, the heavens, the heavens were of old and the earth was standing out of water and in the water. By the word that then existed, perished being flooded with water. But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until that day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But beloved, do not forget one thing. That with the, the Lord, one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering to you, to us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So when we look around and we say, why has Jesus not come back? The, world, the world's pretty rough. It is because God wants people to know him. Remember when we looked at that timeline at the beginning and it said redemption. This is a day of redemption. It's a period in redemption in human history. And God has opened the doors wide and, and sent the call out to be, to be proclaimed by his church to say that Jesus wants to save you from sin. Jesus wants to pardon you from judgment. Jesus wants you to enter into a relationship in love with him that will last forever. But when this day ends, Jesus will come to make the world right and to do away with sin and wickedness and evil. But the problem is that people in their natural state are sinful. And many people do not want to let go of their wickedness. And that they too will be judged and follow under a time of great judgment And so God is patient. And so there's a few things ha about how we should respond in, in light of all these things. And we'll try to go pretty quickly through some major subjects. So, so hang on here. But I, 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 hope, I hope you follow with me. Number one is be ready. Be ready. We don't know when. And it can feel like it's now. But it's always probably felt like it was now. In the 1800s, there are great end time speculations. And... And people went out and wrongly 
sold their goods and went to a mountain and said, Jesus is coming. It was called the great disappointment and gave um, rise to a lot of heresies that were birthed in that time period because people became so obsessed with the, the news outside of the church that they forgot to, to continue being the church. That's kind of the second point. But there was also other times, can you imagine what it would have been like in 1918 with the Spanish flu? Remember that? How many people were dying? It looked exactly like some of the things we're dealing with today. Or what about World War II when the entire world seems to be at war and there is a figure that looks very much like the Antichrist in certain aspects being Adolf Hitler. And there was per- great persecutions and great calamities on the world. But it was not yet time. These were just birth pangs, forerunners of what might come. So know this, things, things will happen. But today is clearly not that day, not yet. I, I, w- I would give you this disclaimer though. As I read scripture and study the world at the time of the end, there's nothing left that has to happen before Christ returns. It could be at any time. It could be today. It could be tomorrow or a decade or much, much longer. My, my understanding about imminence, it could be pushed to another century. But it will happen. Be ready because we don't know the day or the hour. And I also want to say this in being ready. Now, don't, don't try and figure out who the Antichrist is. A lot of Christians waste a lot of time trying to figure this out. Every president has been labeled the Antichrist. You know, is Donald Trump the Antichrist? Before that, it was Barack Obama. Is George Bush the Antichrist? Is, you know, and if it's not one of those people, they pick someone else. Could it be Bill Gates? Could it be, could it, you know, be Tony Blair? Could it be... Uh, I've heard so many possibilities in my lifetime of who is the Antichrist. But the scripture makes it very clear. It won't be revealed until, it won't be revealed ahead of time before Christ's coming for the church. It says the man of sin will not be revealed. So it's a lot of wasted, wasted energy. Stay on task because that's number two, be working. So we're called to be prepared, but also be working. We're not called to sit and date set. And if we think the days are drawing short, if that's what you are convicted, convicted of and convinced of in your own mind, then that should encourage you to live godly lives and to proclaim the gospel. Because how do you want to be found when the bridegroom comes back? Ready? Living as we ought or unprepared? When your parents were coming home and you were a child, how did you want to be found when they opened that door? Prepared for their coming or unprepared and and under discipline? We, We... We need to make sure that we are leaving an impact on our communities. We don't know when Christ is coming back. So you know what? As stewards of what God has given us, we should be witnesses in every aspect of our being. As his ambassadors, as his people, reflecting on what the coming kingdom will look like in terms of stewardship and service and justice and mercy and making that a present reality. Maybe a limited realization of what is to come, but as long as we are here, we are to represent the kingdom. And that means to live in a manner as if the kingdom was already present because as his people, in a sense, it is in our own hearts. So we do are people of faith that are leaving an impact, that are living righteously. Don't be like those people who gathered on the mountains. Do what you're supposed to be doing. When I, when I worked for the state parks, we had one of the park rangers there. Uh, I, was, I was a park aide, seasonal aide. We would go out there and we'd work. We had a lot of random jobs. We'd clean, clean the toilets. We'd mow. We'd prune back the blackberry bushes, do trail management, lots of things that we would do. A very random job, and it was, it was a good job, great job. But one of the park rangers there did not trust our crew. He always thought that we were goofing around. And he had made it his his job to follow us around and kind of police us to see if we were doing what we were supposed to be doing. And it was kind of irritating, but we didn't really care. We just did our job. Actually, the crew did not match his perception of us. We were a hardworking crew. I remember one day, 
myself and another employee, we were up by this water tower and we were called to weed eat all around it. And it was a hot day. And we're out there just knocking down the weeds over and over again. And I don't know how long this park ranger was behind us, but all of a sudden the line came off the motor, I mean, off the weed eater and I had to restring it. And I stopped, I turned off the motor, I looked up and he was sitting there with his arms crossed and a smile on his face. And he said, you guys are working really hard. You didn't even know I was here. And after that day, he stopped following us around because he saw how we were working when we didn't even know he was present. And that, that established trust. See, we don't know when Christ is coming back, but I hope we are found working. I hope that we are faithful in what we are doing. Well, thirdly, be hopeful. Here, here's maybe the most important thing of all. Jen Markell, who's got her own ministry, Olive Tree Ministries, says over and over again, things aren't falling apart. They're falling into place. We see this in scripture of the things which must happen. That doesn't mean that we give up. We continue to be the light and to stand as witnesses for love and justice and mercy and peace and to proclaim the gospel as much as we can. But even the disobedience of man will bring about the Lord's purposes leading first to righteous judgment and then to the renewal that we so anxiously await. At the hands of our Savior as he stands again in physical presence and heals his creation. So, I've gone a long time and I'm sorry for that. But the question is, is this the end? I don't know. But I'm not worried. When I was a little kid, a lot of people were really afraid of nuclear a nuclear annihilation. And I wasn't. You know why I wasn't afraid? Because I read the end of the book and I knew that these things would not happen until, until God allowed in a certain manner. So I knew we were still okay. When we read God's word, we know that the end will come, but he, he does not leave us completely in the dark. I don't know when it will happen, but I do know who does. And I know that he holds me in his hand. My hope is secure. There are birth pangs. And I don't know what that means. Whether his coming is far in the distance or it's just around the corner. But I know who I'm called to be. And I know I'm called to have hope and to live faithfully. But here's one other thing. I also know whether I live to see Christ's physical return or not. I know that my end is coming. It may be decades down the road through some sort of natural occurrence, some sort of disease. It could be tomorrow or today by some sort of tragic accident. And so I need to be prepared to meet Jesus. I need to walk every day faithfully living with hope because I am not guaranteed tomorrow. God God did not leave us as human beings for wrath. Colossians Colossians 3, 6 says, because of these things, that's a big laundry list of sin. It says, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience. But then in 1 Thessalonians, we read, but God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. And then in One of the most famous chapters in the Bible, John chapter three. In verse 36, we read that he who believes in the son has everlasting life. And he who does not believe in the son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. So you see that even though there's evil in this world, even though there is a coming judgment on this world, that we can live with hope because God has saved us from wrath. The wrath to come if you have the hope as I do in the church, but more certainly the judgment which would come because Christ himself has purchased our salvation. And so that I would pray to make sure that you are right with him and if you are to live in the hope of that promise. And if you don't know what we're talking about, please seek us out. Seek out a friend who does know Jesus and we'd be happy to tell you how you can live with confidence far beyond the realities of today. Or even beyond that, you could go to our Facebook page at EBC Dallas. Just look up our Easter sermon when we really talk about what Jesus did for you. But the Bible does say that the wages of sin is death.
but that the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And because of this, though we still live in a world that is afflicted with death and judgment, there is a light at the end of the tunnel. That we have confidence and we have hope. The days are evil, but redeem the time and live righteously for God. Proclaim his name, and when the world acts one way, you act like your savior. Live in love, live in justice, and make sure that our eyes are focused just steadfastly on Jesus Christ, that we can honor him in everything we do. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much.